I'm going to start out today a little differently than normal. In fact, I don't think I've ever started a sermon this way. I'm going to start my lesson by warning you about my lesson. <laughs> and you might think, that does not sound like a good thing. Well, I, I need to warn you because I am going to really come down hard on sin, on the sin of our society in this lesson. This is going to be one of those hellfire and brimstone kind of lessons. And I'm not apologizing about that. I'm just letting you know what you're getting yourself into <laughs> if you keep sitting in, in, in that pew. And I also want to say this. I realize that I uh, can sometimes be overpowering with my voice and come across like a drill sergeant when I'm talking about certain topics uh, or like a sensei. You know, I used to be a sensei. And so the last thing that I want to do in this lesson about sin is to make you feel like, like you're getting grilled by a drill sergeant or by a, a sensei. So I'm going to work on kind of trying to remain calm here, but I have to admit it's hard because I do get worked up when we talk about the sins of our culture as well as the sins among us brethren. So we're going to talk about that. The, the phrase, one nation under God, is, is a phrase we have a lot of affinity for as believers. I mean, it's in the Pledge of Allegiance, and some people want to get it out of the Pledge of Allegiance, but we want to keep it there. And, and I'm all in favor of keeping it there, but to be honest, I'm not sure we were ever one nation under God. And I certainly don't believe that we're one nation under God today. In fact, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, I believe that America is one nation under sin. I think that would be a more accurate description of the condition uh, of our country right now. We're a, a lot like Israel was in the times that we're studying right now in our, in our adult Bible class and in the high school class. In fact, America has a lot of similarities with Israel of old. And when I say Israel, I mean Israel and Judah. Okay. Now, there are ways that we cannot be compared, this nation, uh, to, to Israel of old because we're not a theocracy here. America, we do not have a covenant relationship with God as a nation. We are not the chosen people of God as a nation. Now, that might be new information to some people in America because it's almost like we think that, that you know, the Bible is somehow draped in the American flag, and, and, and it's not. We're not the chosen people of God as a nation. Right? But with there, there is a similarity. There are many similarities between us and the Israelites in their wickedest times, in our attitudes and in our behaviors here in this country. And uh, we learn a general principle in Proverbs 14.34 that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach to any nation. And in fact, the pattern that we find in the Bible is when a nation reaches the tipping point of sin, God is done with that nation and He wipes it off the face of the earth. He did that with the nations that inherited Canaan once the Israelites came and drove them out. He did that with Assyria and Babylon after he used them as tools to destroy his own people. He then destroyed those two nations as well as he destroyed Israel and Judah. And it was all because of sin. So there is a general principle that applies not just to Israel and Judah of old who had that covenant relationship with God, but to any nation that reaches that tipping point. And therefore the language of the prophets that is so condemning about sin and God's wrath does have an application to us in some way, such as this verse in, in Jeremiah 30. Behold, the tempest of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. Now, Jeremiah said that to the southern kingdom of Judah. That's who it originally applied to. But those words, I believe, have some application to us here in America. I'm not a prophet. I don't know exactly what's going to happen to this nation, but here's the principle we learned. This is what I'm going to drive home in today's lesson over and over. It is this, a nation under sin is a nation under wrath, under God's wrath. I'd like for you to say this with me. Let's all say this together. A nation under sin is a nation under wrath. I don't want you to memorize that because it's a wonderful thing to know. But it's a sobering thing to know. It's convicting to know. And so what we're going to focus on in today's lesson are those areas of sin 
in, in which this culture is just like Israel who got destroyed. And at the end of the lesson, I'm going to tell you the solution to the problem the best that I can. The first comparison between us and, and Israel is in this country, people just have no delight in God's Word. No delight in God's Word. Our culture ignores the Word of God. And, and this is just like things were in the days of Isaiah, where he said, for this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord who say to the seers, that would be the prophets, you must not see visions. And to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. That term was Isaiah's favorite word for God. I mean, he just uses it over and over. The Holy One of Israel. They said, we're sick of hearing about the Holy One of Israel. Stop your preaching, Isaiah. We don't want to hear it anymore. It was a willful ignorance. In this country, a lot of people have the attitude that the Israelites had. There's a willful ignorance. They don't want to hear the, the, the Word of God. It's not that it's not accessible. We've got it accessible. You can go to the thrift store and buy a Bible for a quarter. But people don't want to hear the Word. And even those who do want to hear the Word, they don't want to hear it in its straight truth. We want a gospel that will help you lose weight and balance your checkbook. People in America want a gospel that will help you to feel happy and make lots of money. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Prophesy illusions. That's the attitude of our culture that we live in. In fact, our, our society... Not only are they willfully ignorant, they hate those who reprove this society, those who would rebuke, those who would condemn this society. Amos said this, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. I, I can tell you how to become unpopular at work. This is great. The preacher's going to tell you how to be unpopular. Just speak up against something like homosexuality. Just say it out loud at work. Or speak up against any other religion. Speak up against social drinking. There's a lot of ways you can become very unpopular at work. In fact, if you speak up against those things, you might not just be unpopular, you might be despised. You might even lose your job. That is more and more the culture that we live in. All that this nation tolerates is toleration. All that this nation tolerates is toleration. And as long as you tolerate everything, as long as you tolerate every belief and every lifestyle, this nation will tolerate you just fine. But the moment that you stop tolerating everything, you stop being tolerated by America. It's just like Israel of old. And it's scary because a nation under sin is a nation under wrath. Second Comparison between America and Israel, we are in this country obsessed with money and pleasure. So many people are greedy for gain. And I'm not saying we're not. I'm not saying that we're exempt from any of these things. In uh, Jeremiah 6, for, uh, he says, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. See, it wasn't just the rich who were greedy. The poor were greedy too. The ones who didn't have any money, they're still greedy. Greed is a, a condition of your heart. It doesn't matter what you have. It wasn't just the non-religious, godless people who were greedy. It was the religious people. In, in fact, the religious leaders were probably more greedy than anybody. Listen to a sermon a, a long time ago, and this preacher was talking about he didn't have anything better to do, so he turned on the religious station. <laughs> and he was listening to this preacher, this mega preacher, 
talk about this jet that God told him he wanted him to buy. And that's one of the dangers when you think God speaks to you audibly. You hear things that are just not the case, and you believe it. So he told his congregation, I can buy this jet for God's glory if you increase your contributions. And increase their contributions, they did. And he got his jet from the prophet even to the priest. Everyone deals falsely. That's the culture we live in. And it's not only greed, it's also pleasure in our obsession with that. Our nation pushes God out with its pleasures, with our pleasures. Just, just like in the days of Amos. Amos was a prophet. Of course, we, we know Amos, a mess. The people were a mess. And they were a mess because they, they were so blessed. Uh, they were so prosperous. And they, were, uh, they had turned these sources of their pleasure in, into basically idols. And listen to this in, 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 in Amos. Uh, those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp, and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls, while they themselves anoint themselves, or while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. What they're focused on is their pleasures to the exclusion of thinking about the problem of sin among them that was going to make them judged and destroyed by God. Now, when we look at this list of things, there's nothing inherently sinful about any of these things. Is there anything wrong with reclining on beds of ivory? No, but I don't have a bed of ivory. You got a bed of ivory? Have you ever met anybody with a bed of ivory? Probably not. The closest thing I've ever had was a water bed. That's probably the nicest pet bed I ever had. We, the point is, all of this prosperity, they had beds of ivory. Think about that. And what do they want to do with their time? Recline on their beds of ivory. So prosperous, just like America. It, we are so materialistic in this culture. But there's nothing wrong in and of itself if you've got a bed of ivory to recline on it once in a while. There's nothing inherently wrong with sprawling on couches. All of us guys are probably thinking, I'm really glad that there's nothing wrong with sprawling on, on the couch. Nothing, nothing wrong with that in and of itself. Nothing wrong with eating, you know, calves and lambs. In other words, eating luxuriously. We don't think of that as luxury, but that was luxury. We eat in luxury in this country. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself, right? In fact, there's nothing wrong with any of these things except for drinking wine from sacrificial bowls. In the Old Testament, that wine was to be poured out before the Lord. But all these other things are, are okay. I mean, make, you know, writing songs. I, I played guitar for a long time, and I used to write songs. I think the last time I remember writing a song is when I proposed to Holly. and I, I wrote a song to propose to her. I don't think I've written a song ever since. You know where my guitar is now? It is wall art. <laughs> Along with the guitar our neighbor gave us that I don't know why I accepted, it's also wall art. And it never gets taken down. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with playing guitar, please. I know that that's, that's fun. I just simply, myself, personally, I don't have a lot of time for it. The point is this. When the, when the point of your existence is, boy, what, what I really want to do every time I get a chance is I just want to lay around. I want to eat luxuriously. I want to play music. I want to watch Netflix episode after episode after episode until my eyes are burning in the back of my head. Some of us know what that's like. Uh, if that's the point of life, you know what you've done? What we've done in this country is we've pushed God out. No more room for God. There's too much stuff to enjoy, and it's right at our fingertips. We've got it with us 24-7. We can do anything we want, see anything we want, listen to anything we want. No room for God. That's the culture that we live in. I hope I don't sound like a drill sergeant. It's a scary thing that this is the attitude of our culture because a nation under sin is a nation under wrath. 
third comparison between us and Israel. In America, we have a false sense of security, just like uh, in Israel. Our, our nation believes God will never judge us. God will never judge us. Jeremiah had the task of trying to convince the people of the southern kingdom of Judah to submit to the king of Babylon, who was going to come and destroy them. And they just couldn't wrap their heads around that. Listen to this verse, Jeremiah 5, 12. They have lied about the Lord and said, Not he. Misfortune will not come on us, and we will not see sword or famine. Won't happen to us. God's not mad. Besides, we're not really doing anything wrong, Jeremiah. That was their attitude. Same attitude people have in this country. What could ever happen to the United States of America? Nothing could ever happen to us. And part of the reason people think that is the way that God is viewed by those who are even religious in, in this culture, which are fewer and farther in between, farther between. God is viewed this way. You ever see the billboards that say God is not angry? Have you ever read the Bible? God's angry a lot, even in the New Testament. Or I, I heard a, a radio host call the Bible a love letter. Isn't that sweet? It's a love letter. Well, I, I don't mean to be facetious and sarcastic, but the Bible reads a lot more like tough love than it does just a love letter. God's crazy about you. Well, He loves everybody. He sent His Son, but I don't know how crazy God is about people who hate Him and, and who reject his, his holy name. And so since we view God in this culture as, as, as a rule, as just this great, benevolent Father who would do no harm, we only think of Him as a God of love. He is a God of love, but we, in this culture, He is only viewed as a God of love and not as a God of wrath at all. So if He's just a God of love, then what does it really matter? We're going to be just fine. America will be just fine, and we'll all be fine in the end on the day of judgment. Part of the reason people believe this is because of what false teachers preach all across the land in this country. They say a lot of things that are true, but it's what they exclude. They only preach peace. That's all they want to talk about. Everything's wonderful. Don't you worry about anything. Everything's great. Jeremiah 6, 14, they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. If we're convincing people everything's going to be just fine when it's not, we're not helping anything. We're not healing anything. We're furthering the problem. So a lot of religious people, they, they trust in these false teachers. In fact, America as a whole has misplaced its trust in many ways. In Isaiah 30, Isaiah is uh, telling the northern kingdom of Israel, Assyria is going to come destroy you people. And you know what their plan was? Well, we're going to go to Egypt for help. It's kind of ironic. Later, Assyria and Egypt are going to team up together. Well, we're going to go to Egypt. Egypt's going to help us. And so, after Isaiah said, you're going to be destroyed, they said this in Isaiah 30, verse 16. Uh, Jeremiah, or Isaiah says, And you said, No, for we will flee on horses. Now, how's that for a plan? Here's our backup plan. We're going to run. When I, when I was younger, training in martial arts, uh, my instructor taught us all these gun defenses. You do all these cool moves. Somebody's holding a gun up to you and, you know, make you feel like you can do anything, right? Learn all these cool moves. But then he said, listen, he said, if somebody pulls a gun on you, you're probably going to get shot. And I thought, well, that's great. And he said, so if somebody pulls a gun on you, don't really, unless you have to, don't fight, just run. He said, if you run, they might not shoot. If they shoot, they might not hit you. If they hit you, they might not kill you. And I thought, boy, this is great. I mean, I'm coming to learn all this self-defense, and I'm told in this situation, just run for your life. Well, it turns out that was actually good advice in, in, in that case. But that's, you know, what kind of plan is that? No, we will flee on horses. So you know what uh, Isaiah says? Therefore, you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses. In other words, we'll be really fast. We'll get away. 
Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. In other words, Israel, your plans are not going to work. Your backup plan is no backup plan. In America, we have our backup plans. We place our trust in. We've got the Federal Reserve. What could happen to us? We've got the FDIC. What could ever go wrong? We've got the greatest military on earth. At least that's what we're told. Listen to the next chapter. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Woe to those in our culture who trust in our technologically advanced, well-equipped, well-funded, large military, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord because they have the same attitude. They got the Israelites destroyed. It's a scary thing because a nation under sin is a nation under wrath. Fourth comparison between us in America and uh, Israel and Judah is here in America, we're not ashamed of our sin. Our society does not and cannot blush. Now, some of you may not even know what the word blush means. Some of you younger uh, folks, that's when you get really embarrassed and your face turns red. If you've done something bad, you should get really embarrassed and your face should turn red. Some people, though, in this culture as a whole, they don't even know how to do that. That's what Jeremiah said in his day. Were they, not, were they ashamed because of the abomination they have done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. He didn't say they didn't blush. He said they didn't even know how. Blushing, what's that? That's, that's old-fashioned. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. This is a very serious and scary thing. We, we live in a culture that practices sin openly and without defense. When you see two full-grown people of the same gender and the public display of affection going on as if they are to say, as if they're saying to everybody who might be looking, yeah, we're gay, got a problem with it? And does anybody say anything? No, because you can't in our culture. If you do, you're a bigot, even if you do it in a loving way. You can't say anything against that. The way that people dress, especially here in Florida, the things that people wear in public, and I see it, and, and I'm embarrassed for them. I think, aren't you embarrassed to wear that? No, they're not embarrassed. They're proud of it. They don't even know how to blush. They'll wear it right into the church building. What about the way that people talk? The things that people laugh at at work that are shameful. Shameful. The things that people say, the things that people put on their bumper stickers, or the, the bumper stickers that they put on the back of their car that have four-letter words, and I'm thinking, aren't you embarrassed that people are going to see this and know that you have that on your car? No, they're not embarrassed at all. They're proud of it. They're proud of it. The entertainment that we choose. A few years ago, there was a movie that came out. It was a very good Christian movie called Old Fashioned. Holly and I went to watch that movie here in Altamont because it wasn't playing in Orlando. We were living in Orlando at the time. I don't like ties. If y'all see me never wearing a tie sometimes, it's because they go all which way. So anyway, uh, we came to watch that movie and when we walked up to the theater, there was this great big long line coming out. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that at a movie theater. Just long line coming out the door. And I asked one of the workers, of course, that line wasn't for Old Fashioned. It was for Fifty Shades of Grey. Because Old Fashioned came out to be kind of a counter effect to Fifty Shades of Grey. To say, look, this is the way things are supposed to be done in the courting relationship and in marriage. In, in, in Old Fashioned. 
It's a good movie. It actually had good acting, too. A lot of Christian movies don't. This one had really good acting. But this Fifty Shades of Grey, what, what really surprised me, here all these people were, I mean, just oodles of people standing in line, in public, with their faces showing, standing in line for what everybody knew is sexually explicit material. I mean, absolute, complete filth. And they're just standing out here and open. No shame. Don't even know how to blush. It is culturally accepted to be perverse in this nation in which we live. I, I, I could go on with examples like this. Well, our culture also has completely reversed righteousness. We have flipped it upside down. Listen to Amos. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Our culture calls that which is evil and wicked and sinful good. They don't just say it's okay, they call it good. Like when a mother decides she doesn't want the child in her womb. So she decides to have that child, innocent baby, put to death. Do you know what our culture calls that? Choice. That's not a political statement. I'm saying what our culture has chosen to do is put a positive label on it. What's better in this culture than choice? Nothing. Choice is a great thing. Choice, choice is a wonderful thing. So instead of calling it what it is, which is murder, it is called choice. Woe to those who call evil good. And good evil. Christianity is increasingly so being viewed in our culture not just as a bad thing, but as an evil thing. It's harmful. It's hurtful. Woe to those who call good evil. This is all very scary to me because a nation under sin is a nation under wrath. And I believe that this country has a great weight of guilt upon it. If for nothing else, then for all the millions of innocent babies that have been killed in the name of choice. In addition to all the other sins we've been talking about. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to know what's going to happen to America. I don't know when that tipping point is going to come. But the pattern we find in the Bible is when that tipping point does come, God will be done with the United States of America. But that's only the beginning. Because ultimately, what really matters is not whether America stays here. Ultimately, what matters is whether we individually get to be with God forever in all eternity. And if we live like our culture, we're not going to make it. All, all this sermon, I've been talking about the culture around us. What I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about the solution to this problem. We can't control any of that out there. I want us to, to talk about ourselves for a minute. What about us? Do we imitate our culture? We who are the kingdom of God, we are a holy nation who does have a covenant relationship with God. Do we refuse to listen to God's Word? Do we hate those who reprove us according to God's Word? Are we obsessed with money and pleasure? We, the church, do we have a false sense of security and misplace our trust? Are we unashamed of our sin? I'm afraid that too often the standard of Christians, instead of being that standard is God and Jesus who are perfect, instead that standard becomes, well, as long as I'm one step better than the world. That is not the standard. We should be light years 
better than the world in terms of our behavior and our attitude. Light years! And people should see the difference in the way we live. And God expects more from us, His people, than He does the world because we know better. Jesus said to him who more is given, more will be required. We've been given more. We understand more. People out there, it's so easy to be judgmental of them, but they don't know any better, brethren. They don't know any better. So many of them don't. Some of them do. But we know better. God expects a lot from us. Therefore, do not share in America's sin. I don't have the obvious passage on your outline just because I don't want to wear the passage out, but it's Romans 12 and verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. James said it this way, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? And whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He's not writing to non-Christians. James, the brother of Jesus, is very bold, writing to Christians, and he says, hey, you people are adulteresses. In other words, you have been married to Jesus Christ, and you're turning around and being friends with the world, not just friendly with the world, but friends in terms of you're making that the priority in your life. You're loving this world. When you do that, you are committing adultery against your husband, the Lord. Paul said it this way, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things that are done by them in secret. How do we expose the darkness, brethren? Do we do it by standing on the street corner and railing against the sins of our society and by being obnoxious at work and being a goody two-shoes in that sense and getting on everybody's nerves? I don't think that's going to be the most effective way. I think the most effective way to be light in our culture is with great humility of character and with tremendous love We just live different. And when opportunity comes, we speak with humility and love about the Lord that we are so proud to serve. And when people see our lives, they will see somebody that is different. Somebody that lives different. Somebody that doesn't do all the stuff that the people at work are doing. Doesn't talk in the way that all the other people at work are talking. Doesn't dress like all the other people there. But continues to show love and compassion and is a servant even to all these other people that, that do all these things that that person doesn't do. What is it about that person? You know what? That's the best way to do evangelism. And it's going to draw some people, but the majority of people it's going to drive away. Because those who are in the darkness want to stay in the darkness. They're like, when you... When you lift up a rock, what do all the little bugs do? They go scattering for the darkness. That's the world. When you shine the light of Jesus Christ on this dark world, people are not going to like it. They want to hide. They want to get back into the darkness. But some people are going to notice it, and they're going to come to the light. That's our role. That's our role. America is a nation under sin. Let's make every effort, brethren, not to be under sin. Because we are, really, when you think about it, the church is one nation, one kingdom under God. Would you bow your head with me in a word of prayer? Our Father, our Lord, we thank You for Your Word that convicts us that sobers us. We're so sorry because we are so judgmental of others and we don't look inward enough. Give us humility, Father, to to look inward before we look out, to remove that great big log from our own eye before we start removing the speck from others' eye, especially those who are in the world that don't know better. We know better. Shame on us. Shame on us. We repent, Father, of our wickedness and of our sin before You, of convincing ourselves that we're not conformed to this world and we're not anything like this world. 
when we're a lot more influenced than we might like to admit. Forgive me. Help us, Father, and strengthen us to do better in your sight. Through your Son we pray. Amen. I want to leave you with one final verse. Galatians 3.22 But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It's the last thing I want to leave you with today. The real answer to this problem of the sin of our culture and the sin among us is not to white-knuckle it and just try harder and grit our teeth and make more effort. That, of course, is part of, of the solution. God wants us to make an effort. He wants us to strive and to agonize toward that narrow gate. But you're never going to white-knuckle your way to heaven. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much you strive to be different than the world and to be light in this dark world. You're never going to white-knuckle your way up there. How are we going to do it then? By taking all the trust that we are placing in ourselves and that we are placing in this world and even in this country. Take all that trust and channel it to focus and trust only in Jesus Christ. Trust Him with your mind, with your heart, and with your body in your entire life. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. So won't you follow Him? There's nothing better than to be liked and to have meaning and purpose and to have hope of avoiding the wrath of God in the end. It's only possible through Jesus Christ. If you want to join that walk and that life, then you need to become a Christian. Become a disciple. Become a follower. By believing in the Lord. By repenting from your sin. By confessing the name of Christ in the presence of many witnesses. And by being baptized. And continuing to strive to walk faithfully before the Lord all of your days. If you do so, you will be saved by faith through grace. If we can assist you in that, or if you would like our prayers, we ask you to please come to the front as we stand and sing the song. Of